Uh, we continue with the gradient analysis, and I'm assuming uh, you've done lab 7, and I'll, I'll just want to walk you through the interpretation of the results from that lab, because it, I give you a couple of challenges there, so I do want to provide the solutions. And if you haven't done lab 7 yet, uh, just download the PDF here, and then the data set that goes along with it there. Um, so before you continue with this video, you should actually take a little bit of time and see what you can figure out yourself and uh, then compare your results and your thoughts with what I'm going to show you now. Okay, let's import our data set here. So this is a data set of uh, Alberta climate variables and uh, species frequencies by different uh, ecosystems for trees. And so let's bring this in and we can take a look at the variables. Um, so we have uh, ecosystem and biome as uh, class variables, then we have a whole bunch of climate variables, mean annual temperature, warmest and coldest month temperature, uh, temperature difference, that's a measure of continentality, and then we have log transformed precipitation, summer precipitation, uh, variables and dryness indices, also for the year and just for the summer. And then we have a bunch of species frequencies in those particular ecosystems. So I'd like to prepare the data a little bit. So one of the things that we want is work with matrices that doesn't contain these class variables, ecosystem and biome. So we're going to take those out. Uh, so we'll actually use the ecosystems as raw names. So this allows us to put labels on later. And we also want some manual labels. So I'm just going to read this out as a separate variable here. So these are all my different uh, ecosystems. And then we'll take the trees out that were in column 11 to 23. So 11 to 23. Um, and the climate variables were in columns 3 to 10. So if you look at this here, that was 3 to 10. So we have them all in separate objects. And now we can uh, look at this. So this is my data table for the trees, um, with my row names being the ecosystems. And uh, for the climate, it's the same thing. So here are my climate variables, and uh, we can work with this. So let's start with the direct gradient analysis. So this is nothing new. We covered this already in previous labs, uh, ordinations. You can pick any ordination. I do a, a NMDS here. Uh, so let's bring in the libraries. We pick a distance that we like. Uh, you know, you can play around with this for climate. You, you may use a, a Mahalanobis distance or the Euclidean distance also works fine as long as you scale it. So it should be normalized. So you don't want your precipitation variables in millimeter to account for much more than the temperature variables that have much smaller values uh, because it's just there in degrees Celsius. So we can work with a scaled Euclidean here and let's run the NMDS. So solution reached, that was pretty quick. Uh, we write out our scores, just as everything the same as we've previously done. So this is actually exactly the same code that you've seen previously. Uh, and let's plot it. Um, so I use here type N because I don't actually want to see any points. Um, and we're just gonna put our ecosystem abbreviations on here. So that's alpine, subalpine, uh, so that's now an ordination of my uh, climate variables. And we can put our vectors on here. And it tells us which ecosystems are associated with particular climate variables. So my subalpine, upper foothill, lower foothill, uh, they have high precipitation values. And um, the ones down here, boreal, subarctic, northern mixed wood, so they have a high degree of continentality they have very low um, coldest month temperatures and so on. So in here, up here are the warm ones, um, foothill, fescue, mixed grass. So these are actually not forested ecosystems. They are grasslands, high in temperature, um, high dryness indices, high warmest month temperatures. All right, now this is the interesting part. Now that is the direct gradient analysis. So we'll put a second set of uh, vectors on here. And um, so we're now asking which species are associated with those environmental gradients. So we'll just do the same as here. Um, now, in this case, I do put a permutation here because I can test for significant associations. Previously, we always uh, set the number of permutations to zero. 
But now we can actually generate some p-values here for significant associations. And uh, so let's put those on here. And we can also have the results from this vector fit reported. So we'll see this over here. So if we look at which species are associated with those cold ecosystems here, boreal subarctic, these will be black spruce, white spruce, um, B2 pup, that's uh, paper birch and aspen and what else is there? Uh, it's a little hard to read. So this is Pinot Ban, that's jack pine. So these are all northern species that are in high frequency in those uh, ecosystems. So where it gets warm and dry, uh, you see some Douglas fir and then toward the subalpine and foothill uh, ecosystems. So everything that goes to the left side, we get some uh, lodgepole pine, Pinus albicaulis, that's a white bark pine, so that likes the subalpine ecosystem in particular. And then the other ones here, Engelmann spruce and subalpine fir, they also are in these mont montane ecosystems that have a bit more precipitation. So these are cold and dry, these are cool and wet, and then up here it gets really dry. Uh, and there are no tree species here at all, so none of the vectors actually point into this direction. And if I look at the significance of my uh, association here, so these are the correlations with the MDS1 and MDS2, so the overall association with the ordination, that's, a, that's essentially the length of the vectors. Those are listed here, and then um, we specified some permutations so we can see if those associations are significant. So those p-values are uh, generated with a bootstrap procedure. All right, um, so next let's look at our uh, indirect gradient analysis. So some people refer to both of them as indirect gradient analysis, but I like to distinguish three types of analysis, just as I said in the previous video. So in this case, we uh, don't ordinate our climate, but we ordinate our tree data. So let's... Um, uh, calculated distance for all trees. So we run the same NMDS again and uh, we do the same plotting procedure again, um, put our ecosystem labels on there and here we have our species vector. <clears throat> so that's interesting, this is a little bit different than what we've seen before. So as you can see there's a whole thing that is bunched together here and these are actually the grasslands as well as the alpine because they're all treeless. So that, that's an interesting challenge for gradient analysis now. And things like that can happen. So that's why I encourage people to actually always do it both ways. In this case, we are clearly missing structure in our ordination that is real, right? So the grasslands and the alpine are actually not the same, but they are not distinguished here because they are both treeless. So this can also happen the other way around. Uh, so sometimes you, see, you see actually structure in the uh, community analysis that you don't have in the environmental data because you know either you missed measuring a climate variable or it's a non-climatic variable that uh, creates um, uh, differences among your ecosystems based on the community. So it's always important to look at, at both ordinations. So in this case if we add the second set of factors um, it's actually not doing quite as good a job because it just doesn't quite know how to make sense of these opposite environments here. Um, so in, in this particular case, my choice would definitely be the uh, direct gradient analysis, but it varies from case to case. So uh, keep that in mind that they don't necessarily give you the same results. All right, last but not least, an example for the constraint gradient analysis. So that's also sometimes referred as direct gradient analysis, but as I said, I like to have all the three options separate. So let's uh, call the library here and we start with a uh, canonical correlation analysis. We can look at the R squares and the significance of our correlations. So these, these are really high. The tree species are definitely not randomly distributed. Uh, so, so there's no doubt that there are associations. But what's interesting here are the loadings. And I'm just looking at the first three. And uh, so we start with the uh, predictor variables. Those are my climate variables and my response variables. Now we're going to look for high correlations. So let's see. So we got a 0.53 here. Uh, that's Pinus contorta. So that vector here in particular with the high frequency of Pinus contorta, those are associated with, uh, let's see, mean summer precipitation. So that's high. 
and uh, low summer heat moisture index. And so these are these are ecosystems that are you know intermediate. They are relatively cool and moist. Uh, so those are the Alberta foothills. So that's where we have high frequencies of Pinus consorta, so our most productive forestry uh, regions. So those are characterized by high moisture in the summer, and uh, that's what makes them productive and uh, that, that allows that species to dominate these ecosystems. Now, if you look at the second component, what's going on here? Um, there we go. So this lot's high in balsam poplar, Populus tremuloides, so that's aspen, uh, choke cherry. Uh, these are well, actually these are high, these are low, uh, so these are all negative. I don't particularly like this. So sometimes, just to wrap my brain around this, let's put negative signs right here and run this again. Um, so we can do this if we flip both. That is still a valid associations. So now those are positive. So these are the ones that are the highest frequencies in those ecosystems. And uh, those are associated with, let's see what we have here. So relatively drier compared to uh, what we had previously. So warm, relatively warm and dry. So this, are, this is central Alberta, but the southern uh, regions that uh, have those three species. And if you look at the last component here, what's high are the spruces, the aspen, and paper birch. Okay, so that sounds like northern ecosystems, and let's see what our climate is. So in, indeed, uh, we have very low mean annual temperature, uh, we have very harsh winters, and we have a high continentality. Yeah, that's it. So those are the northern boreal and subarctic ecosystems that, that carry those species. So as you can see, this canonical correlation analysis, that gives you a very high granularity in terms of interpreting associations. I, I like that very much. So no other technique actually provides this level of um, numerical summary. So you don't get the plots here, but you get these pairs of loadings uh, for each canonical correlation that can be uh, nicely interpreted. And last but not least, uh, let's do our canonical correspondence analysis. And um, so let's run this. And we get an error. All row sums must be larger than zero in the community matrix. Um, so that happens, and uh, we encountered this before in the uh, ordinations, and uh, not just here. So quite a few distance measures don't like it if you have rows of zeros or columns of zeros. And um, you couldn't delete those rows, but in, in our case, I don't want to because the zero does carry meaning. It just means zero tree species frequency. So, so I don't necessarily want to lose this information. Um, so one cheat here that we can apply is that instead of working with zeros, we just put the very low frequencies here. Doesn't really compromise the um, the inferences or, or the correlations in any way. It just is a workaround so that I don't have to divide uh, by zero. So let's set our tree data set. Uh, let's, I, I'm just cheating here very quickly, just changing all the zero values to actually 0 0.001. That's a very small value compared to the normal frequencies. And then uh, our uh, canonical cor cor correspondence analysis will execute just fine. So what we're interested here is the constrained and unconstrained variance components. So the uh, unconstrained, that's the residual. That's the variance that's not explained. So 85% of the variance in my community is actually explained by uh, climate variables, and 15% is our residual. Um, so we can also do an equivalent to a variance component analysis uh, in an analysis of variance here. So we can just do an ANOVA table of this output file. Uh, those two cooperate, and we see we have a significant uh, association between climate and our uh, species variables. And this here, the model and the residual, those proportions here are the same as these ones. So if you add those two up to get the total variance and you calculate the proportions, you would get exactly the same values as we have up here. So these are uh, uh, this is an equivalent to sum of squares and an analysis of variance. And uh, we can also do this by term. So we can ask for each individual predictor variable is if it's significantly associated with my community data. And uh, so most of the climate variables do. Again, I would actually calculate variance components here. So add all those values up, 
uh, so that's 100%, and then you have to recalculate the percentage of the climate variables, what they contribute. And so mean warmest month temperature is certainly a big one here, and then uh, we also have mean annual temperature and uh, summer precipitation as, as important drivers of species frequencies. All right, and um, so we don't get the same granularity here as we get with the canonical correlation analysis, but we can actually look at a plot that um, uh, does pretty much the same thing. So here we can more qualitatively uh, look at which variables are associated with which components. And so we see our um, northern ecosystems again down here, boreal subarctic, northern mixed woods, upper boreal highlands and so on. So these are rich in black spruce and jack pine. So that does conform to reality. So if we look a little bit over here, so these are the upper foothills. Uh, these are high in uh, Pinus contorta. And then the alpine and subalpine species are Engelmann spruce. So we, all, we already have seen this before in all the other analyses too. So there are re definitely many ways uh, to look at the same data and to bring out the same uh, relationships. So Douglas fir likes the high uh, mean annual temperature and the mild winters. Uh, so everything that's over here, uh, those are the opposite. And then uh, over here, those are the warmer and drier ecosystems. Dry mixed wood is around here. They're rich in the broadleaves like um, choke cherry and uh, balsam poplar. So all these techniques are options for gradient analysis. Uh, which one you pick depends on your type of data. So in this particular case, the really or the only one that disqualified was the ordination by species alone, right? That didn't really work because we had the uh, treeless ecosystems in both extreme cold and in extreme warm environments. So that that way it becomes a little difficult to do a gradient analysis. So the constrained one will work just fine. Or the first option where we did an ordination of the climate variables there, you also don't have issues.